How we doing? Everybody good? All right. Well, we're going to um, uh, jump in. I'm, I'm excited uh, to be getting to do this with my, with my bride up here. So this is going to be fun. Um, you know, we talked about last week, uh, kicked off a new series um, called All You Need Is Love. And I can't say that without hearing the Beatles song in my head over and over again. So you're welcome for that. I don't know that uh, song. You're so little. You're so little. little. Baby. Yeah. Little baby. I know so, the Beach yeah. Boys, that's the only thing. You know who the Beatles are? Yeah. I know who the Beatles are, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. One of the things in our, in our family, just so y'all know, is that Stephanie is eight years younger than me, and so I've seen a lot of great movies, like in the 90s, and, you know, she has never heard of before, and so it's, it's been a thing. Um, but it's all good. So, uh, you know, when I got married, um, I thought that, well, before I got married, I did not think I was a selfish person. And, um, and then I got married, and I learned a lot about myself, um, because I started to realize, you know, I got married when I was 27, and, um, you know, bef- so leading up to that, you know, I, had a, I was a youth pastor and had a little bit of a career, but it meant I could spend money on whatever I wanted to spend money on, you know? So when we got married, and some of you all may have heard this story, I, um, uh, when we got married, I had like, a, y'all know I'm a huge Razorback fan, and so all my money went to like Razorback stuff. And I had like literally like probably 10 or 15 Razorback hoodies. Red. Razorback. red they were all red, yeah. but they were different variations of, of Razorback. And when I got married, um, I had to get rid of all of those hoodies. And um, it was, it took me, it's taken a long time to heal my heart on that. But we're still in counseling. Yeah, we're still doing sessions for that. But I, uh, you know, it, I don't know if any of y'all can relate to that, but I had to learn, right, that this isn't just about me anymore. You know, there's, there's, now there's closet space that has to be opened up, which means I have to get rid of some of my things. And, and, and I learned a lot about myself that, that marriage and really any kind of relationship doesn't have to be just marriage, that it's, it's, it's two sided, right? It's like a little bit last week about just that reciprocity with it, that, that the way relationships work, I believe, is when two people come with a mindset of this isn't what I can, this isn't about what I can get, really this is about what I can give, what I can do for them. I, I think that in the world that we live in especially, that if you watch and you look at some of the, you know, shows that are out or media or, you know, people even that in your life that you know that maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus, the, the culture models this idea of relational selfishness. But how many know that, that Jesus models an idea of relational selflessness? And they're entirely different mindsets. They're entirely different approaches when it comes to um, going about what it is that we, um, how we approach the relationships that we have. There's this verse in Colossians uh, chapter 3 verse 12 that says, therefore as God's people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, it really stuck out to me because these are all values that we give away. These aren't things that we approach and, and we get, but they're things that we give. And so, you know, when it comes to uh, just developing healthy friendships, healthy marriages, healthy relationships, I, I really believe that it's, a, it's not about what you can get. It's really about what we can, um, what we can give. Yeah. Also, he did spend money on like a thousand dollar bike before we got married too. So I feel right like before we got married, yeah. like two weeks before I got married, I was like, "This is my last thing that I'll be able to buy yes. without asking permission." And so I went and bought a bike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Also, know that we have already worked through this, so don't be put projecting your issues onto us. We're fine. Okay, we talk in sarcasm. That's like our main love language. Um, seriously, I, I feel bad when people are like, "I don't know what you're talking about." I'm like, "Oh, I only speak in jokes, 99 percent of the time." Um, Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jordan knows all about that. Uh, So what I want to kind of talk about is, again, with that get and give mentality, right? It's what I'm going to get, what I'm going to get. And I think a lot of times we don't move into the giving thought because we sit there and we think, well, I give more of my time to this person, whether it's a friendship, a family member, a spouse, or whatever. Like, oh, my gosh, but if I – I know that Chase really likes it when – I don't even know what you like, really. It's fine. Um, Let's say he likes the house clean. That sounds really, like, patriarchal, but whatever. You just 
go with me here. If he likes the house to be clean, if I'm sitting there going like, yeah, but last time I did that, he didn't even recognize me. And what if he doesn't help me when I need the house clean and I'm too tired? Or what, you know, I, I don't want to take the kids to school again. Can he do it? I don't want to have to serve him. And it's this like mentality all the time of somebody's got to go first. Somebody has to go first and serve one another and to give to one another. And I think a lot of that times it comes down to love languages. Like I would suspect most of us in this room are actually, their spouse is giving to you. You just don't realize what it is because it's not necessarily in the way that you would receive it. Like my love language is words of affirmation. So afterwards, I'm going to be in the back. Tell me how awesome I did. It's going to be great. Um, my ego needs to be a little bit bigger. And... Uh, but I love words of affirmation. That is Chase's last one on his list. Um, we took that Amen. test. Amen, yeah. And all the guys were like, yep. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, we took the test before we got married. It has changed. So I would encourage if you have not taken the love language test or it's been five, ten years, take it again because I do believe it kind of changes with the season. Like now acts of service is like my love language because, I mean, I still love words, but... I now appreciate acts of service a lot more when you have kids and your life is crazy, right? So I remember when me and Chase were dating, I needed to hear like all the time that he liked me, like all the time, like on repeat. And so I would tell him, hey, can you send me a nice text? And he would send me like, you're awesome. I love you. You're so cool. You know, all the things that I am, but it took him, you know, a second to learn. And, uh, but it was doing that. Well, his love language is gifts. You know, he will tell you it's touch. Guys, if you're sitting here like, I don't need to take the love language test, it's touch. If you're not holding their hand on a Sunday morning, it's, not, it's probably not going to be touch. You're thinking about the recreational bedroom stuff. That is different than, you know, what we're talking about, okay? This is PDA, which we don't do. It's fine. Your love no, language is not No, we do. Touch. There. Uh, bless <laughs> his father. Um, he used to do that, too. He used to go Simba, like, right across my forehead. Yeah. I think that's my church, like, PTSD, like, six inches for me and Jesus, you know? And yeah, it doesn't change Spirit, after yeah. you get married either, apparently, apparently when you're in church. Yeah, fine. so. And I won't call him Pastor Chase either, you know? I don't like no. that either. It's weird. Um, but we are, so I had to learn that, but Chase loves gifts, and that is not my love language. It's just not something I think about. It's not that I'm trying to deprive him of gifts. It's just not what I think about. It's not on the forefront of my mind. And so if we just went based off of what our innate serving is to one another, our, our love language, if I only based it off of the words that he gives me, he, I would feel like, man, he doesn't really like me that much. You know, I just cleaned the whole house and he didn't recognize me for that. And that is not a diss. Please don't read into that. That's just not what he's, it's not on the forefront of his mind. It's just not just the same thing if he gives me a gift and I'm like, cool. And I'm terrible at receiving gifts. Just so you guys know, I'm really awful about it. And he'll spend so much money on a gift. I'm like, that's awesome. And then I lose it six months later, you know. And it's, it's kind of a continual thing with us. But I have to learn to give his love language to him. If he likes gifts, then I can think about something when I go to Target and I'm going to be shopping. I'm like, oh, I'll get him a T-shirt. It doesn't have to be something big. Or maybe if I know that it's acts of service, then whether he responds to me in the way that I would like for him to respond is really irrelevant to what I'm called to do. My actions are not dependent upon what Chase does. My actions are dependent on who the kind of person I am. And I want to value him. I want to say, like, hey, I need you in my life. I love you. And because I love you, regardless of what you give me, I will give you what I can. And we're all going to be in stages where you can give a little bit more, give a little less. You're all in different seasons. But to be intentional, if we prioritized our relationships by, like, how can I outserve the other one, we would not have near the divorce rate that we have in the church. The church has the same divorce rate in the church as it does outside of the church. That's a problem. We should learn how to serve one another. And back to the love languages, I'm going to give some practical advice. I know a lot of you guys were wondering what the crock pot is. Some of you guys know this already, and I, I know there's children here, so I'm going to keep it PG as much as I can. Now, I learned this a long time ago, that girls are like crockpots, and guys are like microwaves. And what I mean by that is all I have to do to Chase is say, hey, bedroom. And he's just like, all right, let's just, you know, pop that in and whatever that button is, and 
he's ready to go, you know? We're more efficient. It's, yeah. We're more efficient. Well, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just was wanting to cuddle, right? Now, girls, guys, just so you know this, we're crock pots. It takes, on low heat, eight to ten hours before we're ready to go, okay? <laughs> if you're on high heat, four to six, okay? But we take some time to get ready. So if you, but we don't, now listen really carefully to this. You are not giving your love language to your wife so that you can go and make food later, okay? You know what I'm saying? We're not doing that, okay? We're doing it because regardless of what they're going to do, we love them. We want to show value to them. I'm just giving you a little inside scoop that that's what's happening when she tells you she's too tired. You haven't done anything all day. Let's, you know, pick it up, pick up the word game, you know, whatever it is. So, anyways, I just thought that was a good food for thought, you know. That's and good. And I like to make Chase feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, and my good. parents that's and good. my mother-in-law. That's just like how I like to go, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. That's, that's why I married you. That's yeah, great. Yeah, I know. It's, um, it's so when you, when, you, when you start to really think about this, right, like you can even think about relationships in your own life. I, I think when they really start to degrade is when it becomes more about what we can get out of each other rather than what we can give to each other. And um, if you're constantly trying to get something out of people, you're going to end up frustrated. You're going to end up disappointed at best. You're going to end up bitter, resentful, offended at worst. Because uh, I got news for you. People aren't going to be able to live up to your expectations. They're, they're just not. It's too much of a demand on anybody. But if our attitude is constantly uh, one of, again, going back to Colossians, of being a person of, that's compassionate, that's kind, that's gentle, that's humble, that's patient. Uh, the, the thing about it is, is, you think about where it's like, well, they don't deserve me to be that way. They, they didn't do anything um, for me. Why should I do that for them? And I would just tell you, because you don't allow other people to dictate who you are. See, all of those values aren't dependent on how other people treat us or don't treat us or what they do for us or not do for us. What it is is Paul's calling the church to say, hey, you're, you're dearly loved by God, therefore you're compassionate. Therefore, you're kind. Therefore, you're gentle in spite of what anybody else may do or treat you or anything else. And if we're only doing those things because of what we can get out of people, then it's false compassion. It's false humility. It's false gentleness. It's not genuine stuff. And, it's, and, it, and it ends up being kind of this manipulative kind of approach to those things, doesn't it? Because, because you're only doing it in order to get something out of the other person. So it's really, it's not about what I can get. It's about what can I give to the other person that we're um, involved with. There's a um, book that I've been reading that's uh, really fascinating. It's a Uh, called The Other Half of Church, and it's written by uh, this pastor that he sat down with a neurobiologist, and he um, was talking about how formation happens, like how we change. Like, this is a subject that I've been really interested in for a long time. And um, he he was talking about just how we change, like how do we develop these um, values? How do we develop these traits, right? Like, you may be hearing about that. It's like, man, I would love to be more compassionate. I would love to be more kind. I would love to be more gentle or humble or, or, or patient with people. Like, what do I need to do? And, and, and what innately we go to a lot of times is to say, uh, I've just got to try harder. Like, if I want to be more gentle, I've just got to try harder to speak more gently, or I've got to try harder to be more patient, as if there's some kind of test that we can take that will allow us to be able to, to, to be those things, but uh, there's no book that we can read that will make us into a more gentle person. There's no test that we can take that will make us more patient. The test of patience is to get around somebody that you have to be patient with and then to practice. The, 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 the test of being gentle is to, in those situations where it would be easier to respond harshly, you respond with gentleness. That, that those things actually become innate in us so that our instantaneous response is one of compassion, is one of gentleness, is one of kindness. But have you ever thought about like how that happens? Like how do people that I know in my life that are kind, that are compassionate, that have these qualities, like how do they become those type of people? Did they just try harder? Did they take a test? What was developed in them? Well, 
What this uh, uh, book was saying, this, this uh, doctor, he was sitting down. His name was uh, Dr. Alan Shore, and he's from UCLA. And he discovered how the human brain um, develops through joy and attachment, is what he was talking about. That, that, you know, you've probably heard before, we have a left brain and we have a right brain, right? The, the left brain is about, like, logic and reason and facts and all this stuff. And, and the right brain is our, our feeling center, right? So it's, it's where, like, the compassion and the kindness and all of that um, stems from. But if you think about how um, you grew up, how I grew up, uh, a lot of times the way that we're kind of taught is very left brain. It's, it's read this more, know these facts, understand these beliefs. And, and all of those things, and they're all great. We need to believe right, and we need to, you know, have all of that, but that isn't what really impacts our behavior. What, what really impacts our behavior is when it filters over into our right brain, and it starts getting into the way that we um, actually, our character starts to change, like who we are on the inside of us starts to really grow and developed. And so what, what he discovered is this, this happens through joy and through attachments. And so when you think about your um, attachments, we model what was modeled for us. We imitate what was modeled for us, right? It's because it's why you are like your mom or like your dad in spite of how bad you don't want to be. You know what I mean? And, 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 and it's, it's because what we do, what you and I innately do, is we go back in those situations that present themselves. We go back in our brain and say, okay, how was this modeled for me throughout my life? And before we even have a conscious thought, we just start reacting to those things. And so you, you, you think about, okay, so how do I handle inconvenient interruptions to my plans? How do I respond in those situations? Or... How do I act when I'm under pressure? Or how do I do when people praise me and want to promote me? How do I respond to those things? How do I show love to people? Well, the way that you do those, it initially comes from what was modeled for you and the people that are around you, whether it be your parents when you were growing up or your friends that are around now. It's why uh, the, the community that we have is so important to us because we become like the community that we're involved with. We become like our closest relationships. It actually does something in us, like innately to develop our character. And so you think about Jesus. When he says things like in John 15, that as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, you may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So Jesus is saying, so I got love from the Father, and that love that I experienced from the Father now funnels through me into you. And then that love that funnels from me into you now funnels through you into others. And and he said it's all interconnected into how close we are to those influences in our lives. That this is how these things are developed in us innately. It's not from trying harder. It's from getting closer to Jesus, from getting around other people that maybe are a little bit further than us. To say, I want to be more kind. I need to surround myself with kind people. I want, to, I want to be more compassionate. I need to get around people that understand what it means to be compassionate. I want to be more gentle. I need to get around people that are a little bit ahead of me that have had opportunities to respond with harshness and have learned how to not allow that to permeate who, the kind of person that they are. And so our attachments to Jesus and our attachments to each other, they channel the flow of Christ-like character in us, our our character, our instantaneous response to the world around us. It's fascinating to me that, 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 that our call, your call and my call is about not trying harder, but it's about the, uh, developing in us such a Christ-like character that our instantaneous response is not to respond out of the flesh, but out of what the Spirit is doing in us. That we respond the way that Jesus would have responded. That is a big call. I mean, think about this. When Jesus was on the cross, his 
as he was suffering and dying and nails were in his hands, he was hanging on the cross, his, his, he was suffering, he was in pain, he was being tortured, his life was draining out of his body. And you know what he did? He looked at his friend and he looked at his mom and he wanted to make sure someone would take care of her. That is compassion. That is kindness. That his gentleness. His first response while he was dying was not one of what can I get, but what can I give? What can I give? These are people that are around me. And that, man, when we live that way, I think it really changes things. We model for our kids what this looks like. Um, you know, our kids have to endure so many church conversations all the time in the car. That's like me and Chase's recreational activity. We're like, so what did Jesus tell you today? Oh, awesome. This person drove me crazy. Great. You know, because if you don't think that we're normal people, we are. We have normal feelings and all that. But sometimes my kids will hear me in probably not the best state, right? I'm, I'm, I'm upset. Somebody has said something. They've hurt my feelings. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I like to, like, express my feelings a lot. So I can get pretty heated and uh, my kids will look at me, and they'll, and they'll say, Mom, like, why did they do that to you? Or why did that happen? Or why did they say that? And I always take that time, and I'm not perfect, so don't hear me on that, but I take the time to say, you know what, they're hurting. They're hurting. I, or I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't mean to. Maybe they just had a really bad day. Maybe somebody cut them off in traffic, and I happened to be the first person that saw them, and I, I said the one thing that triggered them, and that was that conversation they had 15 years ago with their mom, and then all of a sudden we're just at odds. And I said, you know what? I may have to guard my heart with that person, depending on the situation, just like Chase talked about last week, but I'm still called to love them. And modeling to our kids, even to love people that aren't the same as us. You know, what a great opportunity you have in this house to see people from all different types of backgrounds. We have a lot of people that have come from different denominations. We have different religious views in the house. We have uh, just a, a whole gambit of different theories and thoughts and whatever opinions. But if we're, all we're doing is thinking about what can we get, what can we get, what can we get, then we can be sitting here as a consumer in church and say, okay, well, I don't like how that person looks or acts or behaves, so therefore I'm going to take it out and I'm going to go somewhere else because I'm not getting anything out of this. Instead of saying, okay, that person may not, I may not agree with them politically or I may not agree with them relationally or emotionally or whatever, but I'm going to look for a way that I can give to that person because I also believe that person can give to you right back that there can be this joy that happens when we are in community together, strengthening each other. That does, we don't get strengthened when we're all the same. We get strengthened when we have a different viewpoint. There's been so many times in my life that God has changed my perspective on something, not because of somebody that already believed the same as me, but by somebody that didn't. And they challenged me, and they did it respectfully. We don't have to all agree. It's okay. But we can still love one another and move forward in that. And we can demonstrate to our kids what it looks like. Giving people the benefit of the doubt. Giving them our full attention. You know, like not being on the phone at night. I'm talking about even that with our kids. And that's like a guilty as charged, right? Like my kids will be like talking to me and I'm just not even, I'm like in la-la land because I'm, I'm on my phone. Take it down and give full attention. That's when we spark that joy into people. Yeah, the, um, uh, you know, so we get... Uh, our, our character, who we are, starts to, to change as we get around the right people. You know, y'all remember those WWJD bracelets that were like forever ago? You don't remember because you're too little, but uh, the rest of us do. And um, Who's going to change your diapers when you're older? <laughs> That's right. Um, and so, <laughs> you love me. Are you going to shake your hair? Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing about those is, is that when, when you think about this, our, our, the, your character has already actually responded before your conscious thought even has time to catch up to it. Like, like, like those, those things have already happened. And so it's uh, really when we, but when we get around the right people and we surround ourselves with those folks and we, and we start to see, okay, how do they 
how do they speak to each other? How do they handle finances? How do they treat each other? How do they keep the spark in their marriage? How do they manage their time? These things start to shape and form who it is that God has made us to be. And like Stephanie was saying, when it comes to, to joy, it's another way that, that, that forms in us. And so for me, I thought this was really fascinating, that, that, that this doctor, he was looking at um, joy, and he defined joy as joy is what I feel when I sense that someone is happy to be with me. Joy is what I feel when I sense that someone is happy to be with me. So that from the moment that we were born, our, uh, the joy shapes the chemistry and the structures of our uh, brains. And so, so we feel joy when we know that someone is happy to be with us. We also can spark joy in others when they know that we're happy to be with them. And so uh, when you think about uh, having a joyous home, a home that's filled with, with uh, just joy and laughter and the presence of God, when, when you think about having a joy in your marriage, well, are you happy to be with each other? Do you, do you get a sense that people in your family are happy to be together? You know, one of the things that um, to me is so special, um, just as a pastor, you know, there's... Um, I'll, I'll do memorial services and funerals and things and um, just walk with people through all kinds of, of grief and um, heartache in their lives. And uh, it's one of the most special things that, that I get to do. And it, it, it's always, uh, the most special part of it is when you'll we'll go to, you know, maybe somebody's house or even at the hospital or, you know, it could be anywhere. And all the family will be gathered together. And, you know, of course, everybody's grieving and there's loss and there's, there's all of that. But it, most of the time what happens is that at some moment in that, when all the group is gathered together, somebody will share a memory of that loved one. They'll remember a story of what happened. And all of a sudden, there's some laughter. There's some hope. There's, there's a joy that starts to, to permeate in that room, in that situation, right in the midst of suffering, right in the midst of grieving. But when people are happy to see each other, when they're happy to be a, together, when I get that sense that says, hey, this person, even in my grief, even when I'm having a bad day, even when I'm hurting and I don't know what to do, I have people in my life that want to be with me. It makes all the difference in the world. And we ignite that and we spark that in our friendships, and our marriages, and our relationships, that this idea of joy being relational, that you and I actually can't even experience joy except through relationships. One of the things that has really challenged me over the past year is, is being rooted in, in, in strong relationships. Of course, with God, but, but what God really challenged me on, I'm just getting really personal, is relationships with other people. Like, I, I, I realized six or eight months ago that, you know, because as you get older, you get, you get married, you have kids, you get busy, you have jobs and all this stuff. The best ever. The best ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. You don't it's need fantastic. Anymore. Yeah. No. And, I'm your old and, friend. And, and what it in, inevitably happens is we, is we start to lose those connections with just friends, just other guys in my life, other people around me that I just get to hang out with. And we, we miss the importance of that. And I think for so many people, uh, what we're missing is. Joy, because we're not surrounding ourselves with uh, those close, intimate friendships in our lives of people that spark joy in us, that are just simply happy to be um, with us. And so I think one of the primary ways that we get to do that is by just remembering to be happy to be with each other. You know, a lot of it, like Stephanie was talking about, and I am so bad about this, is, means putting my phone down and turning it over or putting it in the bathroom and making sure that the people that I love the most know that there's nowhere else I would rather be, including Facebook. That, that they know that through my eyes and eye contact that we see each other. 
and that they can sense that in us, it's going to create a lot of joy in our lives. And I think, you know, I was actually talking to my parents about this not too long ago, back to like the getting version instead of giving. I think we have it in our mind that like it's going to be so awful, you know, like I got to serve, you know, I have to do this and I really don't like doing this or I don't have the time to do this and I'm going to serve and I'm going to give out and, and all that stuff. And we like, play it out to be so big in our minds. There is such a joy by serving one another. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the stage and whatever. Like, I'm telling you, like, all, this week, Tucker had his birthday. He wanted a new bedroom bed suit thingy. And uh, I do all the Allen wrench work in my house. So, you know, just, you guys know the struggle. Amen. He's like, Amen. You know, Chase's like, oh, my hands hurt. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, let's keep going. I helped. You know? I yeah, helped. You did, you did. I did. I helped. An hour out of the seven, it's fine. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. He does help. We don't keep score. We don't keep score. Yeah, that's right. We lose track. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Crockpot. Um, it's fine. And so uh, I can't sit down the whole time. I don't know how you no, do you're that. Good. Just up and down, up and down. Um, but we, but there's such a joy, like watching Tucker's face after I had worked eight hours putting that bed together. Because, you know, if you've ever done anything with an Allen wrench, you mess up and you've got to redo like 15 steps before that. And so it took me forever. And I got it done. And seeing his face light up when he walked into the room, that was joy. That made all of those eight hours, I would have done it 15 times over to get that face. You know, for Christmas, Jay said, you know, like he mentioned, needing that guy time. And he has some really close guy friends that live out of the state now. And, and uh, they don't get to see each other very much. And I had realized also I was kind of getting selfish with his time. You know, he has to give his time out to so many people. And so I kind of hoard it. Like, nope, you don't get to, don't, don't talk to them. You get to talk to me. And if any time, if you call on a Friday night, you don't answer, that's my fault. Because I will not let him answer that phone call on a Friday night. And, uh, but he loves you. He'll call you the next day. But uh, I, I can get really selfish about his time. Because that's one of my love languages. It's quality time. And I realized that he needed that. And so I planned this whole surprise thing for, for Christmas and got him a guide trip. And he went and spent a few days with those friends. But the joy in seeing him light up about that, it, even though I had a single mom at for five days and it was hard and I was thinking the whole time, why did I do this again? I go, I'm such a great wife. You better do something for me in return. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. You just give to give. Um, but even when it was hard, seeing his face and seeing how great he was when he came back, it made it all worth it. I think sometimes we think serving one another is just going to be such a painful experience. It is the most joyful experience, but it's counterintuitive to what our brain naturally goes to. Yeah, you know, there's a, that scripture in Ephesians where Paul talks about um, the mutual submission, right? Where it says, wives, submit to your husbands um, as unto the Lord. And all the wives said, amen, you know. Um, and and, and but, he, but he says that, and then uh, he, he tells the men, and, and men submit um, to submit as unto the Lord um, and give your life for her like Christ did the church. And, and, and so the call, a lot of times that, that verse has been so taken out of context and so abused and so manipulated as, as from like these guys trying to just boss around their wives and stuff. That is gross. That is not at all what Paul was trying to say. What he was calling us to men was a greater level of sacrifice, was a greater level of giving ourselves away, was a greater level of modeling what it means to not be a part of a relationship that I'm just trying to get, but being a part of a relationship that I'm trying to give of people, two people trying to outserve one another. That's the point of that entire scripture. And Paul, or in Jesus, models this for us so well. In John chapter 13, this is going to be familiar for some of y'all, but I think there's something in here that uh, we can't overlook. It says, uh, John 13, 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, this is right before Jesus was about to go to the cross, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of G Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, 
knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, who was going back to God, rose from supper. And he laid aside his outer garments, it says. And he took the cloth. Crockpot, you know what I mean? Um, and he, and he, I'm not no dummy, you know. Um, and he took the cross. He took the cloth. And he wrapped the towel around him. And his answer to these 12 guys that were imperfect, broken, temperamental, crazy guys, to one that he knew had already sold him out, had already betrayed him, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, knowing the torture and pain he's about to have to endure, kneels at the feet of the guy who was about to do it to him. That has given away your life. See, the call is not one of selfishness. It's one of selflessness. It's one of humility. You know, the, the thing about humility is, is you may have heard this, is not, it's not, humility is not about thinking less of yourself. It's just not thinking about yourself at all. It's just putting other people to say, look, you can betray me, you can hurt me, you can talk bad about me, you can do all of these things, but your actions and what you do to me does not dictate who I am. Because the character of Christ is one of compassion and love and kindness and gentleness and humility. That is what relationships in the kingdom of God is all about. That's what we do for each other as we give over and over and over again. I feel like i got to put my sock on. It's fine. I wish I had a mic like that. I yeah. Have one like that. No, it's you're fine. good. It's fine. Whatever. Um, you know, I've been, that Ephesians verse has been on my heart for over a year, I would say. And because I see like one of two things happen a lot. Um, I see the guy abuse that power, like that head of the home kind of a thing. Like Chase said, that is not for you to say like, hey, I'm the head of the home, so I get to, I get to play video games whenever I want, and you just have to get over it. That is not what that is. It's servanthood. But then also for us girls, and I'm going to talk really straight to the women here, we have to let our husbands serve us. We have to let our spouses serve us. What I see a lot, and I'm guilty, super guilty of this, is I'll, have, I'll ask Chase, like, hey, I'm having a hard day. I need to go have some retail therapy. Will you hang out with the kids? Yes. Okay. And then I'll come home, and, you know, I see the kids are on their tablets. The house looks like a crazy madhouse, and the kids are starving, or they're full off of cinnamon toast That's crunch. never happened. It's yeah, never it's never happened. happened. It's never a very specific <laughs> issue, you know? And... Uh, and I, I have seen this critical spirit come out of me, of looking at him and being like, so you let them have that whole box of Cinnamon Toast Crunch? You didn't play with them? Like, you just let them be on the phone the whole time? And then I start picking at him. All that does to him is make him go, well, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to serve that again. I don't want to get picked apart. And I think us women, we forget that our guys either aren't thinking about it. A lot of times... It's not that Chase doesn't want to serve. He's just not thinking about it. And I could sit here and I could, and I get like, I can be super self-like 
prideful sometimes and be like folding laundry and be thinking about the amazing person I am for folding laundry. And I'm like, you know what? And he never folds laundry and blah, 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 you know, and all that stuff. But I'm not thinking about the fact that he has worked two jobs for 10 of our 12 year marriage. I haven't thought about the fact that he isn't on his phone looking at Facebook, but he's prepping for his sermon so that he can be with us later that night. I don't think about those things. Or, I, or the fact that he's not used to being the one that has to be the primary caregiver in the home. I've been blessed to be a stay-at-home mom. He's not used to that, but we just think, like, you should know how to change a diaper. You don't know how to change a diaper. My dad never changed a diaper. He, I'm calling him out. He's never changed a diaper. It's fine. I'm going to shame him. Shame, 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 Dad. You never learned how to change a diaper. <laughs> or my mom's just a big saint, and, you know, Chase had changed diapers. So, um, but... We get in this critical spirit, and there's like the memes that go around. It's like, you know, me with my kids versus my husband with our kids. Like, no. Our call is to mutually submit. Chase just told the guys, hey, you need to get your trash together. You need to be sure that you're a leader that's worth submitting to. But women, we have to submit. Just like they're going to give their lives for us, we have to honor them not talking trash about them to our kids, not talking bad about them to other people. I I was like one of the main things I ever learned from my mom. My mom and dad never talked bad about each other. The the only fight they ever had was about who was going to go pick up the groceries because they wanted to out-serve one another. I'm sure they had fights. They like to say they've never had a fight, but they just don't tell anybody about their fights. We have fights. It's fine. Um, Amen. It's PDA. Are you okay? I'm good. Okay, that's fine. Um, But I just really want to be clear here. We have to let and honor our spouses. And I'm not talking about trashy spouses. Like maybe you're in an abusive relationship right here. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about spouses who mutually love and respect one another. We have to do it at all times, even when it's hard. Even when it's hard, we have to get down. And we have to somehow undo these shoelaces. That's right. We got to take off the sock. And we have to humble ourselves that we don't know what we're doing either. We think we know what we're doing, but we don't. And we love on our spouse. And we respect them. And we give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not trying to not do something for us. That maybe they're just not aware. We have to speak our needs. I don't know why us women think that our guys are mind readers. They are not, obviously. They are not mind readers. So you are going to have to communicate and not wait until you've folded your fifth piece of laundry from your 18th load or whatever and then go, well, thanks for helping me. I'm like the worst with that. When trash, I don't know if anybody's like that. Chase has about five seconds to get the trash out before I lose my mind after asking That's him. generous. Yeah. Hey, two. It's five. It's about to be two seconds. You watch it. <laughs> But we do it, and we realize, like, we have to honor them, even when they're not perfect. And they're not going to be. The only perfect person in this relationship is Jesus. We are not going to be perfect, but we're called to serve one another. And when we do that, and it's going to take a sacrifice. It's going to be someone swallowing their pride first and being the first one to get down on their knees and wash the other one's feet. That's what the call is. It's not, what is Chase going to give me once I wash his feet? That is not what the call is. I'm called to serve him the rest of my life because he is my husband who I love, regardless of what he does for me. But there is something that happens, that joy that gets reciprocated when you want to be with the person, when you are sacrificing, and not begrudgingly. Not that, like, RBF face. You know what I'm saying? Like... It's not a churchy word, but whatever, you know what I'm saying? When you got the, you look mean, okay? You're sitting in church and your arms are crossed and you're acting like, well, nobody wants to talk to me. Yeah, no one wants to talk to you. You don't look very nice. Like, we want to, I'm being harsh, but it's just the truth. I get so frustrated when people say that. I'm like, you're just not being kind. You got to look like you want to be with them. You sit in, Joy. you sit in the suck with people. That's what the call is. You're called to be with them for better or for worse, sickness and health 
whether they do something for you or they don't, you're called to serve. Um, we're going to wrap up. The band can come up. Um, you know, Jesus, after he washes their feet, he, he looks at the 12 and he says, I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Doesn't get any more clear than that, does it? You know, Stephanie said something I thought was really interesting, that, that somebody has to go first. You know, guys, a lot of times we try to play this head of the house card. I'm the head of the house. I'm the leader of the home. The leader goes first. That's what a leader is, is the one that goes first. The call is to go first. If I could tell the guys anything, that's what I'll tell you. If you're the leader, the leader goes first. We set the tone. We set the atmosphere. If you want to bring joy to your home, go first. If you want to create the kind of atmosphere where you actually do grow into the character of Christ, get around people. Set that tone in your home and in your relationships. This is how we thrive. This is how we grow. I want to um, take a second here as we kind of wrap up. We're going to enter into a time of just worship. And, you know, I was praying about this a lot. And I think, you know, last week, this week, I think the Holy Spirit's been speaking to different ones of you about different things. I think even in this message, I believe the Holy Spirit's been speaking to different ones of you. And I don't know what that is. But I encourage you that as we sing this next song, why don't you ask him? God, uh, what is it you're speaking to me through this message? How can I take what it is that they've talked about and apply this? Whether you're married or not married or it's a friendship or whatever it may be. But how, uh, what is it that you want me to do? I think so many times it's easy to sit through a sermon, sit through a message or even read scripture and be like, oh man, they need to hear that. No, I need to hear that. I need to hear this. God, what is it that I need to do that you're forming in me? Can we do that this morning? Would you stand with me? If you want, as you're doing that, if you feel and you want to come down, I would love to pray for you as well. We're going to open this time up. Uh, but let's just search our hearts this morning. Are you hurting and broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to. Altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Regrets and mistakes Come today There's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows And trade them for joy From the ashes A new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Sing, oh, what a Savior. Savior, His 
Bow your heads with me. Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that this morning, that the word that was brought forth, God, that it would go and it would bear fruit in our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, 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 that we would see, Father, and we would live out the example, Lord Jesus, that you set for us to serve one another, to, to, to be a light for one another, to help and lift each other up and carry each, carry each other's burdens, God. Lord, that we would be people that spark joy in others. God, that we would set the example for our kids. That we would set the example for those around us, God. Lord, that you are forming in us your character. God, that we are a people that will be and already are compassionate, kind, gentle, humble. Father, and right now, I pray for every single person here, Lord, that they're uh, navigating a relationship that's been difficult, that's been hard, that's been challenging, that's felt one-sided. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak right now, that you would give wisdom in what it is that we're supposed to do, that you would give strength, Father, to navigate difficult things. God, that you would give boldness and courage. Lord, and that you would fill us with your fullness, God. Lord, we love you. We praise you. I thank you, God, that you have set the example for us on how to live and how to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give Jesus some praise this morning, church? Amen. If you all would, lift your hands to heaven. We'll pray a blessing over you, and we will dismiss. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Thank you all so much for coming today. We love you all. We'll see you next time. Oh, what I say, Lord, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is